Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, as I am Deb Rose, uh, co-director of Future Church. And this is this um, really is just to highlight some of the what I thought were the main points that Dr. Williams tried to make throughout those two chapters. They are just jam-packed with information and stories. And so this will not do it justice. You'll have to read the chapters yourselves, but I'm just trying to bring out what I thought were some of the most important points. I just wanna thank Dr. Shannon D. Williams for her passion and commitment in researching and writing this chapter of our Catholic history. I know that we are all better because of it. And I wanna thank Sister Marcia Hall uh, of the Albright Sisters of Providence who will offer her witness about her community and her work as a black, black Catholic woman religious. The Albright Sisters, as Shannon will uh, attest, are possibly the most shining example of what it meant to live the gospel during our country's darkest days of slaveholding and segregation. More than any other religious community, they confronted our church's complicity in promulgating slavery and segregation by building up God's kingdom and vision for all. And I love this quote that Shannon has in the book. It says, the Catholic church wouldn't be Catholic if it wasn't for us and that's by Sister Richards. And I think the material in chapters one bears out Sister Richards statement and offers insights into the many ways Black Catholic nuns led the fight for freedom for all throughout our history. Dr. Williams argues that Black women religious have been the key propagators of the gospel since the beginning when they were first stolen and enslaved by European Catholics. And when the Catholic Church chose unholy alliances with slavers and the slave economy, they were there leading with the gospel. And she makes the argument that the Catholic Church was a prime mover in slavery and in the development of the transatlantic slave trade. Pope Nicholas V and Pope Alexander VI gave religious sanction to the crime and original sin of slavery in 1452 and in 1492. And Dr. Williams is clear when it comes to those who claim the church was accommodating societal evils and nothing more because it was a minority religion, this isn't the fact, the facts don't bear that out. While the church may have been a minority, it was clearly a key player in the development and expansion of the slave trade in an era where popes and kings created their own realities when profits were at stake, these popes rationalized and sanctified e evil. And we have here just a, a, you know, a few of the main dates uh, in terms of the transatlantic slave trade and the Catholic Church's uh, participation in it. And what, what we know is that uh, the Catholic doctrine of discovery, which we heard recently heard so much about when Pope Francis visited Canada, is an umbrella term for a variety of official documents and policies that condoned and encouraged the conquering and takeover of land and people for European colonizers. Dumbed Versus is a papal bull issued by Pope Nicholas VI to the King of Portugal. And you can read a little bit of what it says about the church's authority to invade and conquer and subjugate people. And in 1492, a papal bull inter catera by Pope Alexander VI was an intervention in a quarrel between Spain and Portugal on how to divvy up the lands and the people they would enslave. When slavery arrived on American shores in pre-Civil War United States, Catholics with Spanish, French, English, and Irish origins, including religious orders, constituted the largest slaveholders in Florida, Maryland, Louisiana, Missouri, and Kentucky. That's an amazing statement. Bishops, priests, sisters vehemently opposed the admission of Black Catholics into religious life, especially on equal terms with whites. And this timeline shows that Spanish Catholics brought African slavery to St. Augustine, Florida, 
1565, more than 50 years before the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in the English controlled Virginia in 1619. And in the 1600s, English and Irish Catholics codified the inhumanities of slavery. In 1663, they issued a statute that made slavery inheritable and lifelong. In 1664, they created statutes that penalized interracial marriage and barred baptism as a path to emancipation. The 1664 Maryland statute barring baptism is especially illust illustrative. The systems under which slavery operated were different under the Spanish versus the English. In St. Augustine, which was settled by both free and enslaved African descended peoples, and I do have a handout on that, was a segregated city, but also became a homeland for greater freedom for those who could escape their enslavement elsewhere. Because once baptized, they were able to live a freer life. And there's a story about that. In, 19, in 1687, eight men, two women, and a nursing child escaped from Carolina to St. Augustine and requested baptism in the true faith. Florida's governor sheltered the runaways and protected them when the, an agent came for them. The outcome of that encounter went viral, we should say, and soon others who managed to escape began arriving in St. Augustine. And in 1738, Black Catholics established and defended a free town that they had uh, founded called Santa Maria de Mose, about two miles north of St. Augustine. But later in the 1700s, from 1791 to 1804, the Haitian Re Revolution became a really important part of our story. A slave revolt led by many Catholics evolved into a full-blown revolution, the Haitian Revolution, which generated the first successful Black-led independent country. It was a pivotal historical event that cemented abolition in the Americas and led to the rise of Black Catholic sisterhoods in the United States. The first black run independent country was led by a Catholic man who was born enslaved and who became the most prominent leader of the Haitian revolution. And two things are closely tied to the Haitian revolution. That revolution, as I said, cemented the foundation of abolition throughout the Americas. And the humanitarian crisis that resulted from the mass movement of Haitians fleeing the war and destruction also engendered a revolutionary development within the Catholic Church, the rise of Black Catholic sisterhoods. Because white Catholic religious leaders resisted offering services to African and Haitian refugees on par with white people, Black Catholics organized services to help. And so in between 1824 and 1922, eight Black and Afro-Creole orders were founded in the United States and three survive today. So as we see in this uh, timeline uh, on the rise of Black nuns and orders prior to the Civil War, we already see in 1819, we have the first documentation and this is just documentation. There were other, of course, there were other uh, desires before that of women who wanted to enter a religious community. Uh, and in this case, it was the Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And that didn't uh, uh, pan out, but it, there was a document, doc, documented case of, of women wanting to enter. And then in 1824, the, sister, the Sisters of Loretto founded a Black auxiliary community of the Sisters of Loretto at the foot of the cross. Three Black women became part of the community, but were subjected to different dress and different rules regarding the profession of vows. Shortly, though, after that 1824 ceremony, the Bishop of Bardstown disbanded the Black Loretto congregation, so they did not last. What we know and what Sister Marcia will attest to tonight is that in 1829, Mother Mary Lange uh, 
founded the, it, along with three other women, the first community, the successful first community of black Catholic women. It was a revolutionary commitment to black education. It was a revolutionary com commitment to, to religious vocations for black women and a radical commitment to model the gospel in the face of slavery and segregation. The Oblates accepted enslaved women into the order. And in 1831, Anne Marie Beecraft became the 11th member and also brought a very new uh, uh, message to the order. At the age of 15, she had already started her own school. And as, uh, let's see here, sorry, I'm losing my spots. And as Dr. Williams recounts the story, Ms. Beecraft at that age, not only established a black school among the nation's slaveholding elite at Georgetown University, she routinely marched her troop of girls dressed uniformly in procession to devotions on the Sabbath at Holy Trinity Church in the veritable hell of DC slavery. According to Dr. Williams, that act underscores the subversive and emancipatory and emancipatory nature of Catholicism in the hands of African American women and girls fighting white supremacy. I won't say more about the community since we have Sister Marcia here who will also talk to us about uh, the Oblates. Another community that formed in 1842 was the Afro Creole Sisters of the Holy Family in New Orleans. It was formed by three free women of color, Henriette DeLille, Josephine Charles, and Juliet Gowden. The system, the, the community formed in the face of, uh, of a system called placage. Free women and girls of color living in Louisiana territory had few legal rights and limited options outside of marriage and the pervasive system of concubinage known as placage. Under the placage system, white European or Creole men entered into formal long-term relationships with free and enslaved indigenous, African and mixed race women and girls. While the church publicly condemned these civil unions, they were commonplace. At formal dances, young Catholic women and girls of color would be formally presented to prospective European or white Creole male suitors who were also often Catholic. If a match was secured, a contract would be drawn up, usually between the girl's mother and the suitor, stipulating financial support, housing, and sexual relations. But existing church and community records make it clear that the Sisters of the Holy Family felt that this was sexual slavery and restricted free women and girls of color, color already limited or borrowed from entering marriage and religious life, from living lives of virtue and contributing to attacks on, moral, on the moral character of black women and girls. Most, if not all, of the women who entered the order before 1865 were products of placage and thus had firsthand knowledge of its exploitive nature. And Dr. Williams notes that while both of these communities, the Oblates and the Sisters of the Holy Family educated free and enslaved Blacks, Black children before the federal abolition of slavery in 1865, the Sisters of the Holy Family also unfortunately enforced separation between free and enslaved in their school, like most white congregations did. They also had segregated entrance policies. But given this period of history, Dr. William offers these key and critical insights about black Catholic women's power to spread the gospel in the face of, of the abuses that were going on at the time in slavery. The admission of the first generation of African descended women and girls into US religious life marked a new beginning in the black struggle for freedom,
dignity and bodily integrity in the religious institution, the Catholic Church, most responsible for the rise of African slavery in the Americas. She also points out that these pioneering African-American sisters struck at one of the central tenets of white supremacy, the racist belief that black people were innately immoral and sexually promiscuous. And just as white supremacy had been institutionalized by whites, black sisters, Catholic sisters institutionalized black Catholic resistance to white supremacy in religious life. And they also forced the slaveholding church to acknowledge black humanity and commit resources to its black faithful in unprecedented ways. When emancipation occurred, when slavery was abolished in 1865, Dr. Williams points out that it removed one of the greatest obstacles blocking African-American women from entering religious orders. But it also prompted a huge white backlash. For instance, Southern parishes became especially volatile places for black Catholics. The New Orleans Archbishop began mandating segregation in the city's parishes. Whites insulted black parishioners. They prevented black children from being in the choir. White sisterhoods forced black sisterhoods to the back of the cathedral. Orders like the Josephite Fathers in Baltimore opposed, opposed black men and boys who entered, but they also opposed black female leadership and aligned with white supremacy in many ways. They characterized the Oblates in racially derogatory ways. And according to Professor Diane Batts Morrow, they worked to dismantle the Oblates. Se segregation, disrespect, violence, and other forms of white supremacy reared up in brand new ways. And from 1865 to 1900, tens of thousands of black Catholics left the church. This is a phenomenon that still haunts us today as new studies show. But despite all this, despite this strident white opposition to black Catholic agency and self-determination, black sisterhoods grew in numbers. They grew to more than 200 during the first decades of the 1900s new communities formed, as I show here, with Mother Matilda Beasley in Georgia. But as they grew, new problems also emerged. After World War I, state legislatures began to require certification and training for teachers in private schools. And that was a problem for Black women religious since entering most U.S. Catholic colleges and universities was impossible because they excluded African Americans based on race. But black leaders prevailed and were able to pry open the doors of many Catholic colleges and universities three decades before the 1954 Board versus Brown of Education decision. Dr. Williams points out that this was an important, very important chapter in the black freedom struggle. Black education was the cornerstone of freedom. Black children were not only taught basic academics in Black-run educational institutions, they learned to live fully and proudly as Black people, as Black children of God. White supremacist attitudes of white educators were overcome in Black classrooms. The successful accreditation of schools led by Black sisters and the expansion of these institutions outside of the South weakened white supremacy within the Catholic Church. Black sisters' desegregation victories in Catholic higher education and their commitment to producing race leaders trained to chip away at racial exclusion also was destabilized, destabilized the church's segregation practices and policies after World War II. The great migration of African Americans out of the South also had a monumental impact on the church when tens of thousands of Southern black migrant children and first and second generation Caribbean immigrant children entered Catholic institutions 
propelling not only African-American conversion rates, but also an explosion of Black vocations to religious life. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sister Marsha Hall to talk a little bit about her experience uh, in the Oblate Sisters. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am originally from Trenton, New Jersey, and I was schooled by the Oblates from kindergarten through eighth grade at Our Lady of the Divine Shepherd School. No longer exists, unfortunately. But so I was, I am an Oblate girl, um, kindergarten through eighth grade. And my even my experience in that school, that school was, I think it's safe to say was 98% black. There were a few um, Latino children in the school. So I'll say about 98% black. And the emphasis was on black excellence. You, you did what you had to do. You worked hard to be good and to be better. So um, a friend of mine and I were um, the only two women to, um, both of us did graduate work. She in psychology, I did graduate work in sociology, and both of us received Ford Foundation fellowships, and we were the only two from the state of New Jersey that particular year. So, um, <laughs> our lady sisters made their mark on us, I guess I would say. Um, my experience, I would say, first of all, that my parents had a lot to do with my vocation. My parents, neither one of them were raised in Catholic families. My father was introduced to Catholics um, in middle school. My mother, when she married my father, my mother is the only Catholic in her family. And uh, neither, my, neither sets of grandparents were Catholic, but my parents were insistent. They raised us, my brother and I Catholic, and sent us to Catholic schools. They also invited the Oblates and the priests that we had were the SVDs. So they invited the Catholics and the priests to our house. So for me, it was not uncommon to have sisters and priests at our house for dinner or for picnics or whatever. That, that was normal for me. I know in this day and age, young people don't have that experience, but I did have that experience. I didn't think of it as having a, being a culture, growing a culture of vocations, but that's pretty much what it did. I mean, I'm a late vocation. I did not enter religious life until 42, but obviously the seed was planted at some point in those early years. My schooling, as I said, was predominantly black kindergarten through eighth grade and then shifted when I entered high school with the Sacred Heart Sisters. Um, so I went from almost all black classes, all black teachers to um, very few black students and no black teachers from ninth to 12th grade. And then um, that was the last of my Catholic school and the rest was, I went to Bryn Mawr College and then University of Michigan for the rest of my schooling. And, um, now is not the time for me to talk about those experiences. Suffice it to say they were difficult and toxic in many ways. So when I decided that I, was, that I wanted to enter religious life, the idea of entering a predominantly white congregation never really entered my mind. I did do a come and see with one white community, but I wasn't comfortable. So I knew I needed to be in a predominantly white environment for me to be comfortable. Um, coming to the Oblates, even though I was taught by them, was interesting for me in that most of the sisters, or maybe I should say many of the sisters who were in the community when I entered didn't have the options I did. So they came to the Oblates because they didn't have other options. If they wanted to be sisters, they either came to the Oblates the Holy Family Sisters, the Franciscan Handmaids. 
and most of them were introduced to the Abley Sisters of Providence, regardless of where they were from. That was not my experience. I could have entered because I entered um, late 90s. I could have entered any community, uh, but I wasn't interested. They didn't have that choice. And so a lot of the stories that I heard were about, were from women who said, I decided or felt called to be a sister. I talked to a sister in my school who said, oh, I'm sorry, but we don't accept colored girls. You should try the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Some of them went to priests who directed them to the Oblate Sisters of Providence. So, and then once they entered the Oblates, going on mission became um, experiences more, I guess I would say more experiences than racism. I've heard sisters talk about being on mission with priests who refused to give them communion or be having to sit in the back of the church and be the last ones to receive communion. Um, I remember a woman who's no longer an oblate, she's in another community talking about being in a pool. There were white sisters in the pool and when the black sisters got in the pool, the white sisters got out of the pool. So there's all kinds of stories like that, that our sisters, I don't know if I would say take it for granted. They don't talk about it as if, um, obviously it was painful at that time, They've made their peace with those situations and have moved on. I guess it probably for many of you, these stories are new. You've never heard them before. Um, sometimes people challenge that. Oh, that couldn't be true. Or I don't believe that. Or I didn't know that things like that happened. Well, the Catholic Church, as you've pointed out, Deb, is no different from any other institution in the U.S., so that means there's racism in the Catholic church. You have Catholic priests and sisters who don't wanna be bothered, did not want to, and don't wanna be bothered with people of color. And they have, made, they have figured out a way to do that, whether that's in, like I said, refusing to give communion to people or refusing to associate with the sisters in their city and I have also heard stories of religious women who have crossed those boundaries and been punished for it or been chastised for it. I can't remember, might have been an IHM sister that I met this year who talked to me about being in another city with the Oblates and they didn't know they weren't supposed to interact with them. And I think they went out to dinner, they did something together. The bishop called them and said, you can't do that. That's not what you're supposed to do. So as you've pointed out, the history of the church is rife with these kinds of incidents of racism, discrimination, and exclusion. The beauty of the Oblate Sisters, the Franciscan Handmaids and the Holy Family Sisters is that we persevere. We keep going. We don't let those things stop us. They might stop us momentarily, but now you just find another way to do what it is that you need to do. When I read um, the history of the community and listen to the sisters, you hear um, instances of sisters going to missions where the housing was dilapidated, where the roof was slanted so much that the sisters couldn't stand up in the room or there were leaks, massive leaks in the roofs, or uh, the local bishop came to visit and was shamed by what he saw, the, con the conditions under which the sisters were living. The sisters persevered anyway. So the, the history of our communities is that of Attempts at exclusion, actual exclusion, but perseverance despite it. And certainly yesterday, the Feast of the Assumption, for us is Jubilee, the sisters who are celebrating. Yesterday, they celebrated 75, 60, and 25 years of religious life. And what do we say to each other on these feast days? Holy perseverance.
So that's a, a key phrase for us to remember to pray about and, and to live our lives by. I'm not sure how much more you want me to talk about. I can talk, tell you a little bit about my own personal experience. I was in graduate school when I had the first real inkling that I might wanna be a sister. I didn't really pursue it at that time. It took me about 11 years to say my yes, as I tell people I'm a little slow. So I finally, after so many years, left academe and moved to Baltimore, lived with the sisters and allowed my vocation to come forward and flower and develop. So in my time with the Oblates next year, it will be 25 years. In my time with the Oblates, I have been high school principal, vice principal. And now what I do mostly is administration, coordinator of the mother house, uh, council member, uh, liturgy committee coordinator, et cetera. A lot of what I do also is talk about Mother Lang and the, and the history of the community. So um, those are the things that I do to keep her spirit alive and the spirit of the Oblates alive. I, um, I guess I hesitate to do a lot of talking. I prefer if people ask me questions, if that's okay. We could do that if, uh, for just a few minutes if someone has some questions. I would love to hear, I personally, just a little bit more about the founders, uh, sure. Mother Lange, and and um, you know if there, I know that we there are histories written, but it would just be interesting to hear, uh, um, you know, a little bit more about the maybe the older members of the community and their experiences. Well, Elizabeth Clarissa Lang was born in a French-speaking community in Cuba. And she came to the US in the early 1800s, settled in Baltimore around 1810 or so. Her father sent her money. And so she was able to establish a school in her home for Haitian children, and which she ran for about 10 years or so. We know she belonged to a couple of devotional societies um, and harbored a desire to be a sister, but didn't see anyone that looked like her as a sister. Uh, she worshiped in the lower chapel of the Sulpicians Seminary, which is where people of color and women worshiped. Chapelle Boss is what it's called. And um, through her interactions with the Sulpicians, she met Father James Hector Nicholas Joubert, who was a Frenchman who made his way to Baltimore, became a Sulpician priest and was put in charge of the religious education program for the Haitian children and struggled. And so Father Tessier, who was uh, Elizabeth's spiritual director, directed Father Joubert to talk to her. And if you ever come to our mother house, the history of the community is in the stained glass windows. And the first window is of Father Joubert going to Elizabeth's house to meet her and talk to her about establishing a school. And through their conversation, he came to understand that it might also be a good idea to establish this religious community. He approaches the Archbishop who gives his permission on both counts, the school and the, and the community. The school is started in June of 1828. Uh, in some places it's called St. Francis School for Colored Girls, other places it's called School for Colored Girls. Now it's called St. Francis Academy. It is the oldest Catholic school for black children in the country. And I believe it's moving into its 194th year. And uh, Elizabeth and two of her friends along with one of their students started their formation to become sisters. And so on July 2nd, 1829, the four of them uh, made their promises to become the first four Oblate sisters, sisters of Providence. If you come to Chapelle Boss, to the Sulpician um, Visitor Center, 
they will say, they will tell you that the sisters came to the seminary, but that's not true. They made those promises in front of Father Joubert in the house, in the chapel of the house in which they were living. And that comes directly from his diary. He, in his diary, he says he went to the, the house well and said mass for them about 6 a.m. And after mass, he received their promises. So um, in 1832, they were, the community was formally acknowledged by Rome and by then had been accepting new, new members, some of which um, the Neals, who were from Delaware, mother and two daughters, they had run, they had been enslaved, had been freed and were given land in Delaware on which they ran an inn. So when they came to the Oblates, they brought financial skills and money. So you had women who were educators, women who knew how to uh, run an inn, all of whom were interested in serving God and God's people. From the beginning, Mother Lyon, we call her visionary because from the beginning, she took in what were called children of the house. Children of the house were orphans or half orphans. A half orphan is a child who has one parent who is either unable or unwilling to care for that child. And so there were not just sisters, not just women living in the house, but there were also children. So to take care of all those people, the sisters uh, made vestments. And at one point also went to the seminary and Mother Lang ran the housekeeping department at the seminary to make sure that everybody was fed and clothed and everything else that needed to be done. When Father Joubert died in 1843, the Archbishop at that time, Archbishop Eccleston, came from a slaveholding family. He wasn't interested in seeing the Oblates continue, so he refused to appoint a director. So for a number of years, the sisters were without an ecclesiastical director. They had to leave the convent for mass. Um, they occasionally had retreats. And it was through one of those retreats that they, that their, our second founder, Father Ann Wander, who was a young German seminarian who came to Baltimore with Father Shackert, who came to give the sisters a retreat, decided to learn English because he wanted to work with the colored population. When he was ordained, he was asked by the Redemptorists to come and be the ecclesiastical director for the community. Archbishop Eccleston hemmed and hawed and, and Father Ann Wander begged. And so Father Ann Wander became our second founder. So throughout our early history, there are four men's communities that were prominent, the Sulpicians, the Redemptorists, the Jesuits, and the Josephites, important in helping us um, saying mass for us and whatever else needed to be done. So that's sort of the early history of the community. We went to Cuba in the early 1900s. We had about five houses, a number of schools. When Castro came to power, he closed all the schools, said they could be reopened as long as we didn't teach religion. Uh, we were founded for the Christian education of children. So the Superior General of the time Went to, Robert, went to Robert Kennedy and asked him to send a plane for our sisters. And so the sisters who were there came here with what they could carry in their hands, literally came to, where, to the house where I am um, because it was open at that time in the early 60s. And then about three or four years later, we went to Costa Rica. So we have houses in Baltimore, and Miami and Costa Rica. So that's the thumbnail sketch of the community. Well, thank you so much, sister. That was amazing. I just, um, I'm so appreciative. It means so much to hear, hear you talk about the early beginnings and your life and what the Oblates have meant to you. Um, it's, it's there. Uh, 
And I think for me as a white Catholic, um, it's been really good and important for me to learn your history and to understand just how prominent and, and important your community has been to all of Catholicism. Uh, and um, so, and I think Dr. Williams makes it really clear in her book, just how important your community is as well. So I really appreciate that, uh, your, your witness. And uh, so I'll turn this back over to Russ, who's gonna move us forward. Thank you, sister. Thank you again.